Jonah chapter 3. Beginning in verse number 1, the Bible says, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah rose, and he went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. For the word, of the, uh, for word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne. And he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published through uh, Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Lord, we've already enjoyed the service you blessed us with. Lord, the Spirit of God's been sweet. The singing's been a blessing. The testimonies have been a blessing. God, we thank you for it. I pray you'd bless those that are working with the children, the teens. God, bless their efforts and help those young people. Lord, the peer pressure and all that they're faced with in this day and age. Lord, help them to hear the truth, receive the truth, uh, hide the truth in their heart that they might not sin against thee. And certainly bless those that give up their Sunday evenings to teach those young people. Bless their efforts tonight. Help us now from the Word of God. Be with those that are sick and afflicted, those that would normally be here, that are not here tonight. Lord, bless them, help them, touch them, heal them. And God, certainly uh, help us tonight, uh, Lord, to certainly embrace your truth. Lord, may the word of God accomplish that which you will in our hearts. And God, may Jesus be glorified. Father, we love you. Thank you for first loving us, for it's in the wonderful name of Jesus we ask these things. Amen. Amen. Notice a few things from these verses. Uh, I want you to notice, first of all, the patience of God. Look in verse number 1. It says, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. I'm glad for the long-suffering of God. I'm glad He's patient to usward. If you're a student of the Bible and have studied the book of Jonah, in chapter 1, God spoke to Jonah said, go preach to Nineveh. Jonah said, okay. And he went and chartered a, bus, a boat and went in the opposite direction of Nineveh. He's going away from where God called him to go. And you know what happened. God sent a big storm. And uh, Jonah realized the cause of the storm was him. Uh, had the men of the boat throw him over the, overboard. And God had made a great fish. Uh, fish came by and swallowed him up. Uh, and Jonah felt like he was in hell uh, 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 dealing uh, there in the, uh, the belly of that fish. Uh, can you imagine all the acid and all that goes on uh, in, the, in the stomach of an animal that large? Uh, and it's going to the heights uh, of the ocean down to the deep of the ocean. Uh, and Jonah didn't know which way was up and which way was down. Uh, and Jonah in the belly of that fish cried out to God, uh, told God to have mercy on him, repented. Uh, that fish uh, spit him out and he hit the road uh, running towards Nineveh. But we find that God spoke unto him a second time. Can I say, God don't have to speak any, to any of us any time. But if he speaks one time, that's enough. But I find God in his long suffering uh, oftentimes preach to us and preach to us and preach to us, give us more than one opportunity to make things right with him. We see the patience of God that he spoke to Jonah. I mean, he could have thrown Jonah off by the wayside and got somebody else. But he was patient with Jonah. Uh, can I say, notice, if you will, the preaching of Jonah. Look at verse number 4. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, 
And he cried and said, Here's his message, yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, if Thad was here, he would amen if I would say I'm going to preach an eight-word eight message. Huh? Think about it. His preaching was brief. Uh, it's, it's not real deep. Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That was his message. That was it. Eight words. It was brief. Can I say... You don't have to stand and beat your brains out and, and, uh, and wear your lungs out for three hours to get the message across. Mm. When God speaks, mm, it'll, it'll solve the equation. Mm. So many times these guys are trying to impress God. Just get out of the way and be led of the Spirit of God and it'll get accomplished. His message was brief. His message was beneficial. And His message was believable. They believed God. Mm -hmm. you know why a lot of preaching isn't believed today because the ones doing the preaching aren't real believable mm -hmm. can I say the word to preach or word preach means to exhort with a loud voice a lot of these skinny jeans wearing sissified preachers they stand up they don't have anything to say can I say if you're going to be a man of God I'm not talking about a hireling I'm not talking about somebody who fills a pulpit uh, but if you're going to be a man of God, you've got to have a backbone like a saw log. Uh, hey, there are times. Uh, Paul said you've got to be instant in season, out of season. Uh, there are times you've got to stand up and tell people what they don't want to hear. Uh, and Nineveh did not want to hear that God was going to destroy them. Uh, but when Jonah preached, they believed it. We see the patience of God, the preaching of Jonah. But notice the persuading of Nineveh. Look again in verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. They were persuaded. Paul said, knowing the terror of the Lord, I persuade men. Mm -hmm. They believed God and were persuaded. This preacher meant what he said. And God was going to destroy them. Notice the publishing throughout Nineveh in verse 7. And the king, he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor bees, herd nor flock, t taste anything. Let them not feed uh, nor drink water. Uh, 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 he, he had it proclaimed that even the animals couldn't eat or drink water. They were serious. They wanted God's attention. And then notice the pivoting of God in verse 10. God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. God repented of the evil that he said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. That word repented don't mean God was you know, guilty of anything. That means he turned. He turned from what he was going to do, and he did it not, because he saw they turned from the direction they were going. Well, this chapter right here is a great chapter for the topic tonight's message. I'm going to preach on the recipe for revival. The recipe for revival. Lord willing, here at the beginning of April, we're going to have revival meeting. I'm praying we break out in revival before the meeting gets here. Uh, and if we're going to break out in revival, I see the recipe for that in this chapter. Can I say if revival is going to take place, the recipe for revival, first of all, includes rebuke. Look again in verse number 4. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Can I say, revival begins with rebuke. We need to see the error of our ways. We need to see we're not where God would have us to be. I know last week I preached some pretty stout messages, some pretty hard messages. I've gotten some people's crawl. Some hadn't got over it yet. Good. If everything was where it was supposed to be, we wouldn't have to preach that way. Listen, there isn't anybody loves preaching on heaven more than me. I love preaching on heaven. I love preaching on the glory. I love uh, when God just swoops in and does a tremendous work in our midst. But He can't do that when we're not living up to our end of the bargain. If you're going to have revival to bring life back, to bring back that which was lost, that's what revival is, to refocus our attention where it should have been all along, there has to be rebuke. There has to be a 
uh, reckoning with where we are and where we need to be. There was a rebuke. Now, I got some interesting thoughts on this. Now, I done told you Jonah, he went the opposite direction when God called him to go to Nineveh. And then he spent some time, three days and three nights, in the belly of a great fish in a whale's belly before he went and did what he's supposed to do. Can I say, Jonah was mad before he went. God called him to go to Nineveh. He didn't want to go to Nineveh. He didn't like those people. He had a real problem with those people. Hmm? It'd be a good day in our life if we get our eyes off of people and get our eyes on their souls. Hmm? Jonah was mad before he went. He was mad while he was there. While he's there, he's thinking, yeah, God, burn them up. Hmm? How do you know that? Because he was mad after he's finished. If you go out tonight and read chapter 4, you'll find out he was mad, heaping mad. He even tells God, he said, I didn't want to go because I know they'd believe you and you would repent of the evil because they repented and got right. He said, I knew you wouldn't destroy them because you got grace and mercy in you. Hmm? But can I say, in spite of the fact that the preacher wasn't even right with God, God still sent revival. Uh, I've heard it said all my life, everybody has to be in tune with God for God to send revival. No, some folks just need to repent and get right. And in spite of some uh, got a bad, a bad uh, uh, spirit or a bitter spirit, in spite of something that won't get right, if enough do get right, God will send revival, my dear friends. You see, there has to be rebuke. And I say the recipe for revival includes reverence. Look at verse number 5 again. So the people of Nineveh, they believed God. They proclaimed to fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his stone, he laid uh, uh, his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. Can I say? Sackcloth, you would take off your nice fine linens, and you'd put on something like a burlap sack, something that was not comfortable, something that brought grief to you just wearing. And it was a sign to everyone else that you uh, were sorrowful in spirit. Uh, and they sat in the ashes, uh, not pleasant things, uh, filthy things, uh, to show humility, uh, to humble themselves before Almighty God. Uh, and what they were doing was showing God, uh, we believe you, God. Uh, please have mercy on us in our misery. My dear friends, uh, uh, they were reverencing God with their actions. And I say when people truly get right with God, they'll reverence God with their actions. And those that don't have anything to say good about the church or about God, all of a sudden they'll start blessing God and they'll start praising God for the church. Those uh, 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 that never move in the service, uh, all of a sudden they'll move. Uh, uh, they'll be quick to testify. They'll be quick to get in the altar. They'll be praying for sinners. Uh, those that don't witness will start witnessing. Uh, those that do nothing will start doing something uh, because there'll be a reverence in their soul for Almighty God. Uh, you see, rebuke Rebuke brings reverence when people believe God. Hmm? There's any indictment in this day and age? People don't reverence God. All you got to do is go to a restaurant on Sunday and look at folks that come from what they call church and look at the way they look. Their countenance is miserable. And they look like they've been to a ball game, not to the house of God. Uh, when you reverence God, things change in your life. Folks can tell you've been with God. They knew Moses had been with God. They knew that Jesus' disciples had been with God. Uh, uh, folks can tell when you've been around God. Uh, when you start reverencing God, it shows on you. But when you're not reverencing God, that shows on you too. I'll never forget going back, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, we had a young man in the church. I mean, he... He would uh, say amen in the service, and he would testify, and he uh, had a good countenance about him, and, and uh, just was always into every service. And then all of a sudden, he quit saying amen. And all of a sudden, he didn't stay around in fellowship. As soon as final amen in the service, he's gone. All of a sudden, he'd get here late, leave early, 
wouldn't speak to anybody and just, I mean, folks just start saying, is something wrong with so-and-so? Is something wrong with brother so-and-so? And they're asking me, preacher, what's wrong with him? He's just not acting himself. So I called him up. I said, hey, brother, is everything okay? Everything's fine, preacher. I said, well, I've noticed you're just not acting yourself. And I've had several people in the church say, What's wrong, brother? So and so doesn't say me no more, doesn't hang around anymore. What's going on? Well, he got all indignant. Well, if they got a problem with me, they're supposed to come to me. I said, They don't say they got a problem. They're just concerned. Huh? Hmm? You see, when your countenance isn't right, it shows on you. Say, What happened? Oh, he got indignant that I had the audacity to ask him about himself. He went on down the road. To my knowledge, to my knowledge, he's been in six churches since he left here. See, you can change your address, but if you don't change your countenance and spirit towards God, you're going to be miserable on down the road. Hmm? They heard the rebuke. Then they reverenced God. The next recipe for revival includes repentance. Look at verse 7. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast nor flock and all of them not eat and drink. Look at verse 8. But let every man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way uh, and from the violences in their hands. Uh, what happened? They repented. They turned. Uh, they turned from their evil ways. They turned from the things that caused the wrath of God to come their way. Uh, and they turned back to God. Uh, and they cried mightily unto God, God, forgive us. Uh, God, have mercy on us. Uh, God, do a work in our lives. Uh, Friend, we'll never have revival uh, exempt from repentance. Uh, we need to turn uh, from the directions we've been going uh, and turn back to God. Uh, say, God, have mercy on us. Uh, have mercy on our church. Uh, have mercy on our land. Uh, hey, when repentance goes toward heaven, uh, revival comes from heaven. Uh, you'll not have revival without repentance. You can have the best preachers. Uh, you can have the best singers. Uh, you can have uh, cottage prayer meetings. Uh, you can have anything you want go on around the house of God, but without repentance, you'll not have revival. And again, repentance is certain, it's just simply changing, turning from the way you're headed to the direction God wants you to go. Let me see the recipe of revival. It starts with rebuke, then reverence, believe in God, then repenting. But then it takes restoration. Verse number 10, hallelujah. And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them, and he did it not. You know what happened? He restored them. He didn't, he didn't judge them. He didn't do away with them. He restored them. Matter of fact, can I tell you, in your King James Bible and all 66 books and all 1,100 plus chapters and all 773,000 plus words, can I tell you the greatest revival recorded in the Scriptures is chapter number 3 of the book of Jonah. A whole city turned from their wicked ways unto God. It's the greatest picture of revival in the Bible. We see Nineveh was allowed to go on what a blessing. And I say, unfortunately, after this generation dies out, 70 years later, they end up going worse than they were before this. And God destroyed Nineveh so much that she's still not been found. They have dug and searched all over where they thought Nineveh would be. And they can't find it. God utterly destroyed them off the face of the earth. My dear friends, it's a terrible thing to make a vow to God and not keep it. But revival came to this crowd. Unfortunately, they didn't warn their children's children what would happen if they didn't put their faith and trust in God. You know what's wrong with America? The greatest generation 
the generation of the 50s and 60s when revivals and camp meetings and tent meetings were breaking out all over our country and great men of God stood and preached and droves of people came to Christ that generation didn't warn the next generation and that generation got worse by not even warning the next generation and now three and four generations later we're dealing with liberalism and communism socialism not only in America but in our churches it's about time there's a generation that turns back to God it may start with us the last point on this whole message on the recipe for revival is there are repercussions can I say everybody around Nineveh knew what God did for Nineveh even Jonah in the next chapter is upset for what God did for Nineveh. But can I say, almost 3,000 years later, we're still talking about what God did for Nineveh. There were repercussions. There were folks throughout every generation has heard about a long-suffering God that if you'll repent and turn to Him, he will not bring judgment against you. What a blessing. You want to change America? It starts with you. Turn into God. And then it starts with you. Sicking God on other folks. Huh? And watching and seeing what God does. I haven't said this for a long time. But Jesus turned the world upside down with 12 men and one of them was of the devil. Then he elevated the Apostle Paul to take his place, and he turned the world upside down. But yet, in over 2,000 years, the world has yet to see one church totally sold out for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. What could the Lord do with our church if everybody got sold out for the glory of Jesus? How could we impact Florence and Union and Hebron and Burlington and then that affect Grant County, Gallatin County, huh? and then f fan down through the eastern part of the state and the southern part of the state and Lord help even head a little bit north. I know northerners don't know anything about God, uh, but start flowing uh, north, north and west uh, uh, what could God do with some folks that get serious about revival that would spiritually put on sackcloth and ashes start reverencing God seeking the face of God asking for mercy from almighty God it amazes me people ask for God to lower gas prices help the economy people pray God change Washington but people don't pray God change me Hmm? Hmm? Uh, listen I've done read the book David said it he never seen the righteous forsaken or seed begging bread I want to tell you I don't care what the price of gasoline gets I don't care how lean the groceries are God's always taking care of his people are you listening when is his people going to start taking care of God when are we going to take care of the things of God and do what God has left us here to do isn't it about time some folks get serious about revival we can talk all day long about the Antichrist on his way. We can talk all day long about how this thing's winding down. We can talk all day long about how we're looking forward to seeing him and we can't wait to get to heaven. But who are we taking with us? Who are we impacting? Listen, Frank Stinson's name's back there on that, on that banner. Folks, God used greatly since I've been here. I'll never forget Frank and I had a conversation talked about he didn't want to limp into heaven too many from this generation is limping into heaven we ought to go out in a blaze of glory hmm? we ought to go out on fire for almighty God so I wonder would you be willing to ask God for a revival would you be willing to ask God God will you look at me and see if there be any wicked way in me 
God? Am I the one that's holding back the blessings of God? Am I the reason revival's not coming? Will we truly be willing to reverence God and repent and ask God to change us that he might change the lives of others? My dear friends, without revival, there's no hope for America. And without revival, there's no hope for some of our loved ones, some of our friends. We need revival. We've got the truth. We've got all kinds of avenues to get the truth out. You know what's missing? What's missing is the power of God behind us, the presence of God in us, that they see a difference that they don't have. Hmm? You know what caused that Philippian jailer to come in with fear and trembling? He saw something and heard something in Paul and Silas he'd never seen before. And I say everybody's heard about Christianity. Why don't we show them true Christianity? Hmm? Everybody tell you they're going to heaven. Why don't we show them how you get to heaven? Show them a crowd that knows they're going to heaven. And they know we're going to heaven too by seeing the power of God in our lives. I wonder... Are you willing to ask God for the recipe of revival to break out in your life? Will you ask God if there's any ingredients in your life missing that would hinder revival for coming? I wonder, will you seek God for a wicked and perverse generation such we live in? Let's all stand tonight. Brother Ray, come get a song of invitation. Some's already in the altar. I wonder, are you willing to ask God for it? Said you have not because you ask not. You want to ask him? They're coming. Get the song ready. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you for the word of God. Lord, I have been blessed to see some wonderful things and be in some great services and some great meetings. God, I've never seen a people so fearful of the wrath of God that they even made their animals go without food and water. I've yet to see, even in our generation, Christian people that are willing to fast for any length of time in order for the wrath of God to be stayed. God, I pray, Lord, you deal with us as sons. And in your wrath, you'd remember mercy. And God, I pray you'd show us, Lord, anything in our lives you're not pleased with. God, I pray you'd send revival. Lord, I'd love to see a true outpouring of the Spirit of God in this wicked generation that we live in. God, help us not to look to the right or the left, but help us to look toward you. And then God, show us inwardly what's lacking in our lives. And then God, give us the grace to be able to act upon it. And God, speak to hearts in this invitation. Lord, I realize there's enough people in this building tonight for you to send great revival throughout this land. Help us, Lord, not to be stumbling blocks, but stepping stones for the will of God. And God, do a work. Do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. We'll bless you for what you do. For it's in the holy and wonderful name of the Lord Jesus we do pray. Amen. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.